Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking around. This is such a pleasure to see such an engaged group of people. So this panel is about growing Arizona's clinical trial base. Um, this afternoon, we have uh, uh, listened to a really wonderful presentation from Joan, giving us detailed statistics of how we are doing. And um, I'm pretty impressed. I, th I think that we are way up there. Uh, but we'll get into more of the details as I go through the panel members. I'd like them to introduce themselves, a few words about who you are and um, uh, what your role is and your experience with the clinical trial. And I'll start with this, Joan. <laughs> um, I'm Joan Shapiro. I'm at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, as the Associate Dean for Research, which means that I oversee all the research involved in the College of Medicine. This is both from our staff and from our medical students that we are trying to promote into a more academic thought process. We are one of two medical schools in the United States that require every single medical student to do a scholarly project of four years. It must culminate in a thesis as part of the graduation requirement. So this is a major undertaking because I don't have to tell you there's a lot to learn in those four years. So this is something that we are trying to stimulate in terms of the academic thought process. Analyzing data, looking at patients, looking at that unusual patient response, and understanding what the next step might be. So I'm going to introduce myself a little later, tell you a little bit uh, of a background about myself, but maybe Sherry, you can uh, t tell us about yourself. Hello, my name's Sherry Prather, and I currently work with Quintiles, which is the largest CRO in the world. We have a global print footprint of about 33,000 employees. So if you don't know what Quintiles is, I'm happy to elaborate more on that later, but just to introduce myself, my background is in nursing and I was a bedside nurse for a handful of years before I even knew what clinical research was. I worked for a small CRO initially as a clinical research associate, uh, monitoring drug trials at physician sites and hospital sites. And then from there I went into site startup where I worked with sites, getting them up and ready to participate as investigators. And then in project management, uh, so overseeing the full gamut of a clinical study from start to finish. And then most recently, I'm in business development. And I work with prominently emerging biopharmaceutical companies, um, helping them bring their trials um, to quintiles for us to help participate in um, running their studies. Everyone knows Joan, but uh, Joan, I still want you to t talk about your interest in clinical trial because you've done a tremendous job in gathering all of the information, and I know your enthusiasm for this particular area, but I'm just interested to know why uh, the clinical trial is so important to you. Well, I think the, and thank you, Nazneen, and thank you to all of our amazing panelists. When we look at clinical trials, this is what will determine the future. and. We are in Arizona, especially in areas um, of neurology, cardiology, pediatrics, um, and oncology, really leveraging personalized medicine in this area. And it's our ability to lead in areas where nobody has the recipe yet. So it's a great opportunity. Wonderful. So a little bit about myself. I'm Nazneen Aziz. I'm the Chief Research Officer and Senior Vice President at Phoenix Children's Hospital. I've just moved to Arizona one year ago. Um, this was March 31st, just about one year from Massachusetts. And again, you've heard a lot about how active the research uh, is in all of the hospitals in Massachusetts. It's almost like a biotech mecca over there. But to be very honest, I'm extremely excited with what I see over here. The enthusiasm and how we are all engaged through this wonderful AZ bio getting all, the, all of the stakeholders together that Joan has brought together is, it tells me Arizona is poised for something very uh, special. Um, and we've heard about the statistics, we are not too far behind, and we are doing quite well. But my first question would be again to Joan, um, and to all of the, our other panelists is, is there room for improvement? What could we do to grow our clinical trial base that we are not doing perhaps? 
You know, I think there, there are a couple of things, and as I shared earlier, good trials require two things. They require solid investigators, which we have, mm -hmm. and they require a patient population that can support that trial. Recruitment is one of our biggest challenges, as we've heard earlier today. So the better that we can inform the population, and I had an excellent conversation at the break with one of our attendees about the fact that we don't tell the story very well. And um, I think it was, we're singing to the choir. So I think, you know, if we can take more of what we've shared here and now take those messages out, we will have greater success. And Pete's, Dr. Aziz, which is your area? <laughs> That's is, a great area for growth. Right, and um, really uh, in pediatrics, it's um, woefully shameful that we don't develop drugs for children. We give them adult drugs in a, you know, a smaller dose. But there are only one or two examples of where uh, drugs have been developed for children. So that is an area I'm hoping to grow at Phoenix Children's Hospital in creating drugs specifically for children's diseases, uh, be it inherited diseases or for children's cancer, which is very different from adult cancers. Children's cancers are not so molecularly complex, but yet we are giving them adult drugs. Um, and so, the, and, and we'll talk about more of that when we get to precision medicine, but I'd like, Sherry, do you want to comment on what you think we could do to grow our clinical trial base over here in Arizona? Well, first off, I, I love hearing what Joan to my left had to say about your uh, med school and the four-year requirement that your students undertake because that's one of the things I see as um, a hurdle. I, I've seen it, I've seen we're overcoming that hurdle, but I still see it there that um, growing participation in clinical studies, I think starts with who has access to the patients, which we first think of doctors. I know we have a lot of community outreach and I think of the I'm in, that's that is really cool. I think of that kind of as the Got Milk campaign that mm -hmm. we need to advocate for to see that uh, a lot more. But if we can get more and more doctors, nurse practitioners, people who have access to patients, whether they're ill patients or not, um, they are the ones who will start, start those conversations on a one-on-one -on -one basis so that people understand what research is, understand what clinical trials are. I can tell you in my own personal life, I come across people all the time who don't understand what I do. So I like to explain that everything from the Tylenol you take to the Band-Aid that you use went through a clinical study. And it, it's a labor, very long and labored process, but um, I think just talking about it and speaking to it will help um, overcome that hurdle. Um, as more and more. Wonderful. Joan, do you want to? Well, efficient, uh, physician leadership is incredibly important because without that questioning mind, there was someone who is willing to do the paperwork. Um, when I started in the business, we won't say how many, many years ago, <laughs> um, a consent form was two pages or a page. And you did the surgery, you got the biopsy, and you could do the research. Now most consenting processes are 27 pages long. That takes hours. So it's not the physician who has the time to do that. So the other important person in that team is the uh, clinical research coordinator, the nurse. And therefore, these two people have to work closely together because this nurse not only does all the paperwork and does the consent, but she's got to do the screening because one of the things that we know if we put people on a trial that may be uh, with drugs of, from another nature or have uh, unhealthy behaviors, these are all issues that can impact on the trial. So there's lots of things that we have to think about when we talk about clinical trials. But physician leadership is absolutely key because that physician who says, how, why is it we can't win this war? Or why is it these three patients responded, these two had no response, and this one had a partial response? And so these are the kind of questions that clinical trials can begin to answer. But that's how we have to marry now, not only the observation of a clinical trial, but with what um, <clears throat> Mark was talking about, the genomics, how we can actually put genetic data with patient data. So it's important to understand we need two types of physicians, those who 
are willing to see patients, take good care of them, have excellent uh, training and backgrounds. And then we need the other physician who is willing to write a grant or willing to go that extra mile. And that requires a whole different philosophy of, of understanding of what it takes. Amazing. That's a wonderful insight. Um, another, the area that I would like to now move into, and we've touched upon that, is the uh, area of precision medicine. And you may have heard about this, but what it really means is giving the right patient the right drug at the right time at the right dose. We're nowhere there. Precision medicine or personalized medicine is another word for it, is at its very early stages. And so what do I mean by that? It means that if I'm on Crestor, I might be doing fine, but if I'm put on Lipitor, I might have some serious side effects. But we are doing it right now on a trial and error basis. But if we knew right from the get-go that if I do a genetic market testing that I am not suited for Lipitor, but for Crestor, then we wouldn't have to go through that. And some of the um, you know, side effects are pretty serious. I and mean, there are lots of drug-related toxicity that happens. And so this is what's called a companion diagnostics that comes along with the drug. It's packaged at the same time. So that is where FDA is really promoting this personalized medicine where you are stratifying patients based on their genetic marker, or it could be a protein marker, to say that these are the patient who will have this drug and not the others. But so even in the process of the clinical trial, you're including these sort of um, genetic markers or biomarkers to stratify the patient and then see their response in terms of efficacy and also toxicity. And so my question to my panelists is, what could we do to get into this new cutting edge, innovative uh, drug development um, to encourage pharmaceutical companies to do? Because I think, I'm just gonna give uh, where I think um, uh, Phoenix and all of Arizona could do well is our ethnic diversity. I was so encouraged to see the clip that you showed that we have 30% Hispanics. We, from my uh, demographics at Phoenix Children's, we, we know that we have lots of um, Native Americans. So these are, um, and, and NIH and FDA are encouraging that you have to have at least a certain percentage of your population of minor, minority. So I see this as an advantage, but I'd love to hear from my panelists to see what they think about getting into this precision medicine based on genetic differences, or even personal differences are based on genetics. I can go. Well, you know, I think that one of the, and precision medicine is critically important that we can get the right drug to the right patient at the right time, or equally important, that we don't give the wrong drug to the patient at all, Absolutely. which is critically important. Um, as a business person and an economist, my biggest fear with personalized medicine is that we are going to continue to make our subsets for drugs smaller and smaller and smaller so that the economics of bringing these drugs to market, we're not gonna have a big enough patient population just to justify it. And good drugs will not get developed. And so we, as at the same time we're developing the science, we have to be able to develop a clinical trial process and a legislative process, both at the state and federal level, that supports our moving in that direction because there is no economic model for a series of one-offs. Mm -hmm. And so as we continue to go through this, we have to make sure that we don't go so far in one direction or the other that we miss and suddenly break the system. And I think that will be our biggest challenge as we move forward with science. Sherry, do you want to add anything about precision medicine? Or? I mean, I, I can. I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to get too deep into that topic, but I certainly can speak to the fact that we do have sponsors who uh, 
bring in that optional portion to research, um, and it's an optional part of the study. So, so participants, patients, or whether they're a healthy volunteer or not, do not always have to participate in that. But I do see that fairly often where there is that optional piece. And I think, again, that will go back to kind of being the advocate and bringing that up to, to volunteers who, who wish to participate, the importance of it. It's an optional piece, but what it can do for us in the future and what we can learn from it could be very valuable. And Joan, you know, you've done some very interesting work in your past about looking at tumor and genetic differences and how they respond to chemotherapy. I'm just wondering, what do you see from the scientific aspect of precision medicine and looking at biomarkers? I think the <clears throat> most important thing is if you live long enough, you get to see your own research validated. In 1981, I published a paper in cancer research that said no two tumors were alike, even though the diagnosis was identical by histopathology. And that was not a well-received concept way back then. Um, fortunately, we now understand that patients do differ. You may have a diagnosis of breast cancer at a particular stage, but in fact, the genetic evolution of those two tumors have become very different and therefore your response to different drugs will be different. And this is what we would like to focus in on in terms of we know that some drugs like tamoxifen are very good for a general group of people, but there are some that are very resistant to it. They can tell us important information. And this is what I'm talking about when it comes to research is asking or seeing that unique patient or patient responses to a given uh, chemotherapy. So it's, it is important to understand that we are the most unique people. There are over five billion people on this earth and no two people have exactly the same genetics, including identical twins. twins. I can detect them, their differences, because of the way nature has designed us to be unique human beings. So we can generalize, and that's what was alluded to in the previous panel about outcomes, because we have tremendous amounts of data in our hospital systems, but we haven't put it together. We haven't made assumptions on what has really responded in, in those particular arenas. So it's, it's really important for all of us to stop thinking of Macy's versus Gimbel's, and I'm an old New Yorker, so anybody who's from New York knows what that means, but it's the kind of thing we have to communicate with one another. We cannot be enemies of one another if we belong to this hospital system versus that hospital system. If we don't share information, if we aren't willing to work together to centralize our efforts, we're always going to have a, a rather slow incline to where we would like to go. We have the basics here in Arizona. We have the population diversity. We have certainly the healthcare industry growth. And so now we really need to be able to communicate and work together sharing information so that clinical trials, the most important thing to a drug company, and I think this will share mm -hmm. a vouch for this, is time and opening the trial and closing it because now you have patient accrual. So this is an important criteria. How can we centralize our efforts? And that's something that is being talked about. Again, politics always become a factor. And so we need to be aware that we need to break down some of these walls because we have a common enemy, the disease. And that's what we should be focusing on in terms of bringing trials to our state. You can see in our community, there have been these jewels in various institutions. The Alzheimer's Institute is one, Barrow is another, Mayo is another, and each of them are building on certain diseases or focus. But we need more of that, and we need to have the expertise brought into our community because of the diversity that we have here. It attracts physicians. So this is something that we need to be able to figure out is how to finance startup packages <laughs> to keep encouraging that kind of recruitment. So all of that plays into our success in clinical trials. Wonderful. 
So a few more words about um, you know, precision medicine and looking at the genetic differences in cancer because more and more what uh, John alluded to is becoming obvious that cancer is not considered a disease of the organ anymore. It's not breast cancer or pancreatic cancer. It's really a molecular difference. So you could have um, you know, five different women with five different molecular defects that's le leading to breast cancer. Or you could have a child with a pancreatic cancer that has a disease uh, uh, that has a gene that's mutated for breast cancer. So would you give them that breast cancer drug? So it's really the cancer, the whole focus has to be on the molecular defects and not as an organ-specific defects. But in order to do that, we need to do the genetic analysis at the start of the trial, where we enroll them, do the molecular, or what's now, nowadays it's possible with this new technology called next generation sequencing to sequence a cancer and to understand the molecular defects and then give the cancer, the child or the patient a drug that is suited for that particular molecular mutation. Wouldn't you rather do that than put them through chemo, which is so much toxic and can lead to um, you know, rampant um, side effects? Because even though you might cure the child's cancer, then they grow up with a lot of comorbidities. So these are thoughts that we have to look at. And I want to go back to some of the value of precision medicine, although it does uh, lower the, limit the market size. But even pharma companies are coming to the understanding that yes, there'll be many small markets now for their drugs rather than one big blockbuster drug. Um, so they're coming to the realization that that's important to do because I think we heard at lunchtime somebody was saying that a lot of good drugs get not approved because we don't have the statistics. Maybe we chose the wrong kinds of people to give it to because we didn't do the companion diagnostics at the start of the trial. We didn't stratify the patients. So these are thoughts we really need to take in to consideration and I'd love to see more growth in this kind of innovative trial design. Um, so now moving on to the next uh, topic is, you know, we, when we talk about clinical trials, we have to th understand that clinical trials can be observational trials where you're not intervening. These are not interventional trials with a medical device or a drug, but you're just observing whether a standard of care a protocol of management is better than a new way of managing the patient. And there is value in that. And I would love to understand from our panelists, if you want to comment on this, um, like what, what are your feelings about our, our observational trials at Quintiles, Sherry? Do they do that kind of trials? Because as you said, like even a Band-Aid would need some sort of a clinical trial. It's not intervening, but you're trying to see whether it works. Right, and, and there are, uh, we do conduct observational trials. Um, I am, do not have an expertise in that, but I can speak to the fact that sometimes there'll be a subset or an arm to uh, an interventional trial where there'll be the observational piece or they'll follow patients uh, long after mm -hmm. a dosing has occurred to see what the um, long-term um, follow-up would be. So we do participate in that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I Any think comments? What we'll see is that as the, we fine tune patient populations. Mm -hmm. The discussions that we're having in DC right now are very much around, we will have to have smaller sample sizes, we'll have to get safe and effective drugs to market earlier, and we will have to monitor post much longer. Post and so where it used to be, we, we had a very long head and a very short tail, it's gonna flip flop. And I think that's what we'll see as we go forward. And I, let me just add one thing to that. There is um, an, a segment called real world late phase, which is where there is observational studies um, post-market where we can see the long-term um, either side effects or outcomes mm -hmm. to um, trials or, or to drugs that were previously approved. So um, monitoring how those patients are doing long-term is ongoing. Absolutely. That's a critical part of the trial phases. As you know, phase one is mostly for safety. Phase two is for 
um, mostly safety in every part of the f phases of the trial, but also efficacy in phase three is definitely efficacy, but phase four, which is post-marketing, is extremely critical to see if uh, patients, when you give it to the larger population, are developing side effects. And a lot of drugs came to a halt because of what we found out post-marketing. Any comments on observational trials or post-marketing trials, Joan? Uh, no, um, they're incredibly valuable. And the more diversity we have on that, the better chance we have of seeing the unique. Um, we all know that penicillin for most of us is pretty good, but for some people it's almost a death uh, cause. And so what is good for myself may not be good for someone else, and that's why clinical trials are so important. I have to tell you, though, there are a lot of people who do not understand clinical trials because when I was in a position to get calls from patients, they would say, I'm not coming to your hospital if, you're, if I'm going to be a guinea pig. And that's how some people view clinical trials. It is important for a physician to always point out, you are receiving the standard of care for this particular disease. This is the experimental component of the clinical trial I am asking you to participate in. And so making sure that the patient knows they're going to get the standard of care, but we want to take it one step further um, combine it with something else or uh, dose it a little higher so that we know what the outcome will be. But there is always an experimental component to the standard of care. And the other thing that patients should know that's important to um, communicate to our community is that a patient can withdraw from a clinical trial at any time. It is their right. Patients have rights. Now, we hope that won't happen, but the facts are that patients sometimes it's too involved or they just have too much trouble getting there. There's lots of reasons. But th I think we need to make clinical trials a much friendlier environment than I think a lot of people perceive it as. They consider themselves a guinea pig. And yes, there are many patients who are terminal we have no other answers for them, and they are willing to subject themselves to perhaps a, a procedure, intervention of a drug or a device that may or may not be beneficial to them. That's much more experimental, but the average clinical trial looking at dr new drugs, looking at new ways to, uh, to dose those drugs is in fact very clear a, a standard of care. The only objection I ever have to clinical trials is sometimes when there is a drug against a placebo. I still sit on IRBs, that, that always gives me trouble. Because if we really want to know if this drug has some efficacy, we really do need to compare it to the standard, standard of, care. of care. And so those are issues I have personally, but that's because that's why we have in institutional review boards to make sure that the patient's safety is always in the forefront and that the investigator who's conducting the trial and the, his team of researchers are qualified to do that trial. Any government trial requires <laughs> the principal investigator to fill out a very long form and pledging certain um, responsibility. And that principal investigator, no matter who commits any sort of fraudulent behavior, is responsible. So that's why I say physician leadership, it takes a, a person who's really interested in that to be able to communicate um, and, and stay with the academic course, because it, it's, a, it's a tougher course. But we need it, and we need to get out to our community. As a Caucasian, my going into Hispanic community or um, Afro-American community is probably not the best. Mm -hmm. What I need is leadership within those communities to go in and talk about these things. I'll be glad to go with them, but it's important for people to see people of their own background or their own ethnicity so that they feel comfortable with what we're trying to tell them and communicate. So again, communication, communication, and communication. Wonderful. 
So we've got two minutes left, and so I'd like to end with all of the panelists with general comments of what you think we should do more to get Arizona more in the cutting edge, you know, interesting trials, and uh, just general thoughts on how we could um, increase our trial base. Okay. Continuing the conversation, I think we need to talk to the sponsors. We need to find out why sponsors are coming to Arizona, mm -hmm. and equally important, we need to be interviewing the sponsors that are not. Why are they not doing trials in Arizona? Mm -hmm. and we have to answer, then look back at ourselves to answer that question. Right. Um, I think these are great topics. And one thing I just want to make sure um, to point out is that there's a lot of work being done in Arizona. I know um, personally my company has worked with seven to 800 different sites within Arizona, and we actually have a dedicated individual to the state who can collaborate with investigators. So if anybody wants to know, you know, how do you get involved, um, feel free to reach out to me, but you can go through Joan because Joan has my contact information. And if you do know a physician or a site that wants to participate, they may be naive to research, by all means reach out because I could potentially put you in contact with someone who, who could help you um, get involved. And that's exactly what I think Joan's and her team and everyone here's efforts are, are working towards. So just wanted to make sure you knew that. Wonderful. Joan, any last I'd like words? to see the hospital systems do a better job at communicating clinical trials within their own organizations. I used to sit at tumor boards and have some of the community physicians, and this is what's important. We have employed staff and we have contracted physicians. We cannot forget that population of doctors mm -hmm. because they're key. And they would sit there and say, gee, I didn't know this trial was being done. And that's, a, that's in my mind, a tragedy. It's just, just such a... a an error in our, our communication ability. So that's what I'd like to do is, is get that word out there within hospital systems. It should be their responsibility to make sure a tumor board takes place for every single type of tumor that's being looked at in that hospital um, because that's a requirement now. So communicating to our physicians that are out there seeing our f patients as first-line physicians they are incredibly valuable to this process, and we often overlook them. Mm -hmm. And so my last words would be, really, we, I hope that we can get away from being, um, you know, just a community-based hospitals in Arizona, because if you don't do research, which is clinical trials, then you're not getting there. You have to have cutting-edge therapies that you're offering to your patients. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone in the panel um, and thank you to the audience for sticking with us to, for this interesting discussion. Thank you.